Welcome to the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Quality Corner Show, where we talk quality of healthcare and explore what that actually means. Let's dig into performance measurements, the equip platform, pharmacy goals, and personal goals. We will also occasionally cover topical healthcare news and maybe throw into the conversation a few of our own nerdy passions and hobbies. So turn us up. The Quality Corner Show starts now. Hello, Quality Corner Show listeners. This is your host, Nick Dorich, and we welcome you to the next episode of the Quality Corner Show. As you know, our focus is on quality improvement and education. When speaking with pharmacists and pharmacy team members, most of the conversations recently have focused on how the workflow and operations for pharmacy can be optimized for a flu season that is expected to be incredibly busy. How does a pharmacy prepare its staff for this deluge of patient care activities? How do you prepare for the storefront with clear signage? What changes are you making so that patients can get their vaccination and still stay under observation for 15 minutes? There are numerous aspects of patient care that can be impacted because of exceedingly busy pharmacy operations while also maintaining safety for patients and staff members due to COVID. A few episodes ago, we had the pleasure of hosting Ben McNabb, and he shared how he has been communicating with his staff and patients. It's always welcome to have other perspectives and information for the quality improvement process. For that reason, we decided to bring in another expert to talk about immunizations and pharmacy. Therefore, let me introduce our guest for today's show. His name is David Zagarek. David, welcome to the Quality Corner Show. Thanks, Nick. It's great to be joining you and your listeners. David, you recently had an interview published in Pharmacy Times about this topic, and that was what inspired me to reach out and learn more from you. Before we get into this topic, let's hear about you. Do you mind sharing your experience in pharmacy, your current role, and your contributions to pharmacy? Of course. My experience in pharmacy goes back to my pharmacy education at the University of Wisconsin and my experience as a community pharmacist working for ShopCo, a pharmacy within a discount store which served communities in the Midwest and West for a number of years. While we were a very busy community pharmacy, we were also asked to manage the pharmacy as if it were our own, which meant we put a great deal of time and effort into not only managing our pharmacies, but also taking great care of our patients. After this experience, I decided to go back to graduate school at Ohio State, where I learned the skills to teach and perform research in pharmacy management and leadership, something that's been the focus of my work for the past 30 years. Over those 30 years, I've been on the faculty at Midwestern University in Chicago, at Drake University in Iowa, and since 2009, I've been at Northeastern University in Boston. I've taught pharmacy management and leadership to over 5,000 pharmacists, and I've had a role in what many other pharmacists have learned and been taught through my research, as well as in my role as an editor of the leading textbook on pharmacy management. While I no longer actively practice pharmacy, I have had leadership roles in a variety of professional pharmacy associations, including now I serve as treasurer of the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy. And I stay in contact with many of my former students who so many I'm very proud of the fact that they've gone into administrative and leadership roles themselves. Finally, my wife, Michelle, is a pharmacist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center here in Boston. So I remain engaged in what's happening in our profession on a variety of levels. Thank you for providing the additional information, David. I always appreciate having the opportunity to speak with someone smarter than myself, and we've definitely achieved that with your participation today. I I also really like that you've had a variety of experiences in the pharmacy practice landscape. That's very important. Pharmacy is a big world. There's a lot that we can learn from others in the profession just because uh, our experience may not be the experience of every pharmacist. I think your roles have really encapsulated that as an example. Now, let's go ahead and get get into our discussion for today. Again, we're going to speak about immunizations and pharmacies and the impact because of COVID-19. David, are you ready for your first interview on the Quality Corner Show? Yes, let's go for it. So as we record this, flu season is already here, and with COVID-19 continuing to impact public health, it is important for us to discuss methods that pharmacies can use to help, quote unquote, flatten the curve and aid patients. With the projected increased demand on pharmacies due to flu immunizations, what tips do you have for communities pharmacies to help stay afloat during the flu season and COVID-19? 
Well, on one hand, the demand for the goods and services that community pharmacies provide has never been greater. After all, we are the most accessible healthcare provider, and our patients and communities need high quality goods, services, and information more than ever. But, and it certainly goes without saying to this audience, there are significant challenges in providing these goods and services. Many of these challenges are unique to our current environment. Our ability to stay afloat, not only financially, but also physically and emotionally, will depend on how well we can meet these challenges while meeting the needs for our services. Thanks, David. Now, with this, what have you seen or heard about pharmacies doing that maybe is a unique approach to providing patient care services? I, I've heard from some pharmacies they've looked at doing uh, patient care services or immunizations in parking lots or just taking on some some different ways of doing care services. Do you, do you have some examples that you can share that you've seen pharmacies use? I think a lot of what we see certainly is is that pharmacies first and foremost are recognizing that we are now providing care for our patients in the midst of a pandemic, an infectious disease pandemic, and it requires uh, certain precautions uh, that we typically haven't had to take uh, in dealing in providing services to our patients before, uh, whether it be the plexiglass screens we're seeing put up at our pharmacies, the use of PPE uh, and other protective measures. We are doing so much more to be able to not only provide a whole new level of service, but to do it in a way that's safe and, and provides our, our clients and our patients with that level of confidence that they can come to a pharmacy and not only receive high quality healthcare goods and services, but that we're looking out for them and that we're going to protect them and we're going to do everything that we can to, to keep them safe. And, and I know we, we've seen many, many examples of pharmacists that are, that are doing just that. Thanks, David. We'll move into our next question. And I've got some other ideas with, with that first, but uh, the first question we've gone over, but I know we're going to hit it or go into it a little bit deeper with question three. So we'll, we'll hold on to that for later. Right. Uh, going back to your interview in Pharmacy Times, you discussed the enhanced role of pharmacy technicians to provide uh, patient care through administering immunizations in some states and even aiding in organizational workflow. Student pharmacists or interns may also play a similar role in many pharmacies. Can you please describe for our audience how pharmacies should be preparing their technicians and their students or interns so they can contribute to pharmacy success and how they play a role in promoting safety for patients entering the pharmacy? Sure, Nick. Yeah, the roles of technicians, interns, and student pharmacists have all rapidly evolved over the course of this pandemic. Many states have issued emergency orders enabling support personnel the ability to take on new roles to support pharmacists' efforts to provide high-quality care. Pharmacies and pharmacists must realize that just because regulations now allow support personnel to take on new roles does not necessarily mean that every role should be taken on by these personnel or that there isn't a need for education and training to enable personnel to step into these new roles. Pharmacies are thinking about what they want their support personnel to do and then making sure that they are prepared to be able to do it effectively. So I think the role that education and training and our role as pharmacists to be able to provide that education and training to our support personnel is essential so that we can really take advantage of these opportunities that pharmacists have. David, there's a couple of points I want to make sure we cover with this, because I, as I understand it from you, regulations may change so that technicians can do more, interns or students can do more, and ultimately freeing them up to do additional work allows the pharmacist to do more. But I think your point is that we need to make sure that the education and training for each of those roles is specifically managed. Um, just because something is allowed, it doesn't mean people are effectively trained to do that work. Um, from from the from go right. So where do we, whether it's as a pharmacist, whether it's a technician, whether as an intern, um, do we get that new information? Do we get those new protocols? Is that something that we work with our employers? Is that something we work with our state boards of pharmacy? Do we have to work with educators like yourself? Where do we get that new information so that we know that it's okay to proceed? That it's okay for us to pass go 
I, you know, exactly. And I, and I think first and foremost, of course, is being aware of what each of our own state's regulations will allow and not allow us to do. And, and we're seeing different approaches in that. You know, I think universally we're seeing in general more and more that is being allowed. The way that's done, though, is, you know, some states are taking an approach more like um, we're going to say these are some specific things that support personnel can't do and then it's the pharmacist tech you know discretion to say the support personnel can do anything else that that's the pharmacist at their discretion wants them to do other states are are being a little bit more prescriptive with their approach they're saying these are specific things that support personnel can do um, and then it's up to the, the pharmacist to enable them to do that you know at the end of the day it's still you know as they taught us in pharmacy school it's still your license on the line it's still um, our decision as pharmacists to be able to say just because a regulation allows for something doesn't necessarily mean that that's the right thing to do in our circumstances so then I think the next step after taking a look at the regulations is really looking at your own operations your own pharmacies needs um, you know what it is that you're trying to do or need to do and in each pharmacy is likely going to have their own answer to what roles they want their support personnel to take on after you've made that determination then of course yes it's it's natural to to know or to, to understand that we all need training we all need new skills if we're asking our support personnel to do something they haven't done before um, they're likely going to need that education and training just like we needed education and training to be able to take on the roles that we have in pharmacy school in many organizations um, you know there are folks that are involved specifically in educating and training support personnel as to what they need to do other organizations it, it may be in the hands of that individual pharmacist to decide you know who you know what we need to do how we need to teach you know there are there are resources at universities and colleges and others those of us that teach for a living of course but at the end of the day you know it's going to be really the a decision that individual pharmacists are going to need to make for their own pharmacies as to how they, they most effectively want to work with and train their support personnel Thanks, David. Some topics that we've covered in a number of previous episodes with the Quality Corner Show have focused on the, the importance of pharmacists advocating for their patients, mm -hmm. focusing on the topic of communication, and focusing on the importance of education and training. I, I bring those all here because they're all going back to just your discussion right there. And it's important for each pharmacist, each member of the team to embrace that. And if you're working with an organization that isn't considering or taking advantage of those, think about how you can be part of the solution, right? I, I always work with my teammates in identifying in that, or sorry, in that if you identify a problem, you should be the first one to also identify the possible solution, right? If you're going to present the problem, present the way to fix it. Um, and if you don't know what that is, that's where you go out and, and look for more. That's where you communicate with others to really find that. And I think that's where we have a key inflection point for pharmacy, uh, you don't have to go very far with any of the different association work or public health sectors to see that for pharmacy right now, for healthcare in general, there's a lot of people looking for help. Pharmacy as an industry and as a profession presents a possible solution, but we still have a lot of specific details that we need to address to get there. Yes. All right, David, we're going to move to question three. And during the flu season, patients may be less likely to leave their homes um, and, and, and they may have to figure out how to effectively practice social distancing. In your article, you've discussed the need for more marketing to educate patients on the services provided by community pharmacies. Because of social distancing, that can impact how we effectively market what a pharmacy does. So what tips do you have for marketing in community pharmacies and how can pharmacies engage patients and potential, potential customers or patients uh, when there's potentially less of those face-to-face -face interactions with a pharmacist? Now, now more than ever, pharmacies will be reaching out to our patients to let them know that pharmacies are a source of immunizations and other resources that will keep them healthy. And staying healthy is another way that we can all contribute to battling COVID. 
the fewer people who influ experience influenza, and particularly the fewer that experiencing severe symptoms that may require hospitalization, means that not only will each patient stay healthier, but that health resources can be preserved for those that are going to be battling COVID and other conditions. Pharmacies will be using a variety of marketing techniques and forms of promotions to communicate our messages to our appropriate target audiences, ranging from advertisements on TV and radio and newspaper. Now more than ever, of course, we're using social media to be able to communicate with our, um, with our clients and our patients. Public relations, uh, particularly the use and working with media to continue to position pharmacies and the pharmacists as essential providers of immunizations and other healthcare services. And, and most importantly, and I say this, there's still a role for face-to-face -face communications, albeit that face-to-face -face communications may now occur via telepharmacy or other, through other modes of technology. Um, that face-to-face -face communications, or in the marketing lingo, we'll refer to this as personal selling, um, is a very important tool that we have as pharmacists. Um, it allows us and our staff to be able to interact with our patients, to be able to continue to answer their questions, to be able to alleviate their fears, and, and at the end of the day, to provide that reassurance that we are still there for our patients and we can and will continue to be able to be in a position to meet all of their health needs. I was having a conversation with a fellow pharmacist last week about this topic and it, it came up and David, uh, your pharmacy school and your curriculum may be different, but at least from when I went to pharmacy school, we didn't have a specific sales training or business <laughs> class within the pharmacy school program, right? And that's something that a lot of pharmacists will, will point to when it comes to clinical services. But uh, in my conversation with this pharmacist last week, I did note we are extensively trained in patient counseling, mm -hmm. patient interviews, doing a soap note, right? Where you're looking to get some of those key details and you're creating a medication action plan for that patient. You think about this in a broader sense, that's effectively sales and marketing with that patient just done under a different light. Exactly. And so every pharmacist, exactly right. yeah. so it's for a pharmacist, that again, we may not necessarily have had that business class, but we have those conversations with patients. At some point here, it becomes simply, how do you effectively get that mention to the patient, to their family, to their caregiver, and present the opportunity. I think there's a much larger conversation we could have and, and that many others are having and where I would encourage pharmacies to um, you know, talk with their uh, talk with, with others in their community and to talk with their legislators about making sure that pharmacists can be involved with whether it be COVID testing, COVID immunizations. There's a lot of things where pharmacy will be able to assist these public health needs where there currently may be some roadblocks. But for the time being, it's to your point, let's focus on communicating with the patients. Let's make sure we have that outreach. It's a bit of working smarter, not working harder uh, to that context that's there and, and utilizing a lot of the tools that we may already have. So something, you know, I do teach marketing is part of my pharmacy management courses um, that I've taught. And one of the first things we remind students, of course, is that marketing really is nothing more than communication. You know, we are communicating in a variety of ways to be able to help our patients understand how we can meet their needs. At the end of the day, that's what marketing is all about. And, and the more effectively we can communicate, the more effectively we can meet our patients' needs, uh, we'll, we'll be in a great position to be able to do that. David, that's a great end cap for our conversation with our three primary questions for the Quality Corner Show. So I'm going to transition us to our closing at this point. And on behalf of the Quality Corner Show, uh, please allow me to express our gratitude for your participation today. Uh, I think what we've considered here is that there is no shortage of opportunity for pharmacists and pharmacy team members to contribute to optimizing patient care, whether it be for routine care or to help improve access to care during a pandemic. David, uh, between you and I, we are both big fans of a wonderful sport, that being hockey, and we are in the throes of the Stanley Cup playoffs currently. So uh, for our listeners of the Quality Corner Show, we always like to end with a little bit of a fun question. So my question for you is going to be related to that fantastic sport, sport of hockey. If pharmacists are members of the healthcare team and our healthcare team is like a hockey team, 
what position is the pharmacist playing? That's a great question, Nick. And and I I thought about this for a while. And I is the more I th- thought about it, I'd really honestly have to say that I think that pharmacists are the defensemen of the healthcare team. We certainly have been holding the line, holding the blue line, especially you know when it comes to keeping COVID at bay. Um, and then when I think about the ability of pharmacists to triage on behalf of our patients, you know, think of this: we're always looking to make that great pass to another member of the healthcare team that's heading towards the goal. You know, just like a good defenseman will do. I, I think that the Boston Bruins defenseman Zdenia Chara would make would have made a great pharmacist. You know, think about. It. Uh, Z-Man speaks seven different languages, and as the captain of the Bruins, he's led them through a variety of different situations, uh, many challenging situations, of course. Um, The one thing, at six foot nine, it would be pretty difficult for the Z-Man to hide behind the pharmacy counter. That's we I, I, like I said. This is my fun question at the end of each interview. We always keep it professional, but always like to make sure that we're being pretty personal. Yeah. And uh, and David, that answer is probably the my favorite one that we've had for a question on the show <laughs> now. And I absolutely agree with you. Uh, pharmacist an essential role, an important role, uh, and playing part of that defense that's there. But uh, using your example, your metaphor with Zidane Chara, that's there, really known as that defenseman type. Uh, I, I live in Carolina. I like you, I am a Boston a Boston Bruins fan, but I live in North Carolina now. Uh, we have Dougie Hamilton here with the Hurricanes. Oh, oh and, don't, don't get me started with Dougie. Yeah, oh, yeah but uh, so my, my, my transition here, while well, you've got Zidane, who's the big defensive guy, Dougie is more the defenseman that scores. And I think that's an important message for pharmacy as well, right? That we've got an opportunity to be more proactive in helping our patients and helping the healthcare team um, really achieve that end goal. And you can't win a hockey game without scoring a few points. And yeah. that's, that's really where Dougie fits in as a defenseman. And that's where pharmacy, our opportunity going forward, we got to figure out that opportunity. We get, we have to get that transition so that we're showing more of those wins with the healthcare team. Um, your conversation today about how pharmacy helps contribute how we adjust with COVID is a good conversation. Some of our previous chats with folks like Ben McNabb have also helped shed some light on this. So I hope all these items are really helping to build the message for pharmacy. Um, Now, now David, this was a fun question for us. And it was a real pleasure for me to chat with you today about this topic. If our audience has any questions for you, uh, how can they reach you? And then also, uh, do you mind referencing or sharing where where folks can find your interview with Pharmacy Times? Certainly. Uh, Probably the easiest way is to just simply check me out on my LinkedIn site. You know, so just could do a search on LinkedIn. I'll tell you, there is only one David Zagarek. So if you type David Zagarek, you know, Z-G-A-R-R-I-C-K, you will find me. Um, And and as far as the um, Pharmacy Times interview, I know that's accessible on the website. Um, Again, if I don't know if you uh, provide resources for people to just simply you know, hyperlink to it from your website or whatever, but I'd be be happy to be able to provide provide you a link so that that make it easier for your listeners. David, thanks for that. We'll be sure to include a link for that Pharmacy Times article in the show notes so that uh, folks can reference it. Uh, for our audience today, I hope you've enjoyed the perspective provided by Dr. David Zagarek. Our team at PQS always appreciates having other pharmacists and pharmacy advocates that are willing to spend their time speaking with us and ultimately for you, our listening audience. David's perspective on immunizations is important to consider right here and right now to optimize immunizations and maintain patient safety. But if we listen to his ideas for process improvement and not just specifically for the fall of 2020, we can realize ways to implement these strategies through various processes within our workflow. A frequent theme on our show, and I hope that I mentioned it every week, is that we must continue to listen and evaluate our improvement strategy. None of us are perfect, but we can be perfect in adhering to basic principles of a quality improvement strategy. Therefore, my call to action for today, write down the two or three things that you learned from David. Then consider how you can implement them with your immunization strategy. Consider how you will track and evaluate your changes, and determine how you judge success. As you move forward in time, evaluate how you apply those successes to other endeavors, and also consider what elements you need to give them a little bit of fine-tuning. Now that we've covered that topic, we're going to wrap up our recording for today. So with that, we thank you for listening to another episode of the Quality Corner Show. 
And until next time, our team here at PQS has a couple of favors to ask of you, our podcast listener. First, we encourage you to share this podcast with two friends, because if you share this with two friends and each of them shares it with two friends, it really helps us hit a larger listening audience. Second, We also want to take a moment to remind you to subscribe to the podcast wherever you may find it. And then if you have any questions or topics you would like us to address, please contact us. The best way to do so is to email info at pharmacyquality.com. Let us know what is on your mind and what we can address so that you are fully informed. Our goal is to continuously improve our podcast content and to provide meaningful information to our listeners based on current topics in healthcare, technology, and quality measurement. We want to help you become as effective as possible in how you care for patients and improve public health outcomes. So until next time, we wish you well.